Well, welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. We're in John's epistle, 1 John chapter 4 tonight. And in this chapter, he's going to be discussing with us uh, spirits. And he says, I want you to be discerning about spirits, about this. We live in a physical world, but in, within and surrounding this physical world that we live in, there is a spiritual world. And in this spiritual world, it's inhabited with both good and evil spirits. And they have an impact upon the thinking of all of us in this physical world. So we're to be discerning when we hear these things from these different spirits what is good, what is not good. Because not everything that comes from the spiritual realm is good. There are teachings that come from demons and from the kingdom of darkness. And these things are meant to discourage. These things are meant to deceive. These things are meant to distract and they're meant to destroy us. So he tells us here in this chapter, the Apostle John says, I want you to beware of what's going on in this spiritual realm because there are many who are coming forth as teachers who are teaching things that are actually their, their, their doctrines, their teachings of demons. And these demons are using the minds and the mouths of people to get this evil teaching into the world to destroy people. So John says here, beginning in verse 1, he says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Even at John's time, many false prophets are going into the world. How much more so in our day? These, uh, there, there are spirits who are behind these false prophets. They're lying spirits, they're evil spirits, they're wicked spirits, and they want to lead people astray. And he says you must have discernment here. Don't believe every spirit. There's a passage in 1 Kings chapter 22. It's about uh, uh, a good prophet. His name is Micaiah. And... He is silenced by King Ahab because every time he speaks, Ahab becomes so upset with him because he's always telling the king how he's doing wrong. Well, finally, King Ahab brings him out and he, all these other prophets around the king are saying, go forth in battle, you're going to have victory. And uh, Micaiah, uh, uh, Micaiah, he comes forth and he says to the king, hear the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. Spirits all around him. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One, suge one suggested this, another suggested that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said, by what means? I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets. I'm going to go out, I'm going to speak to his prophets. I'm going to give them these lies and they're going to give those lies to the king. And the Lord said, you will succeed in enticing him. Go ahead and do it. Now, this is the Lord putting a deceiving spirit in the minds of the prophets of yours, Micaiah said to uh, the king. He says, this is what God has done. He's put this lying spirit into the mouths of your prophet. The Lord has decreed disaster on you, King Ahab. Ahab wouldn't listen to it. Ahab wouldn't listen to him. But that's what took place. Uh, in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus said, Satan is the father of lies. He's the originator of all deception. And we need to make sure that we check everything out. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 21, test 
everything, hold on to what is good. Right now in our world, we're being overrun by all kinds of evil doctrine, all kinds of evil teaching. And it's teaching that comes from these lying spirits, these spirits from hell. And we're faced with lies on a daily basis. There's a powerful demonic influence in our world today that seeks to replace the truth of God with a lie. And that has been going on since the very beginning uh, of, of the gospel. That has been going on since John's day. And we see it even now. Verse 2 says, this is how we can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. He says, false teachers, deceiving spirits, error on who Jesus is. And they err on his divinity and or his humanity. Jesus is both God, 100% God, and he is man, 100% man. This is what the church has, uh, through the ages, called the hypostatic union. He is God, yet he is man. Uh, if you want to know what's being shared with you, is it from God, or if it's it not from God, is it from evil spirits, then you have to determine whether, what, what the person is saying. What are they saying about Jesus? Uh, this is the first test for any cult. They always err in this area of who Jesus is. He is God. He is God. You remember in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, when they brought the paralytic before Jesus, and Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. And they said, Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they were right. Only God can forgive sins. But Jesus was saying, I am God. And then he said, well, so that you'll know that I have power to forgive sins, take up your mat and walk. And he took it up and he walked away. Jesus was saying, I am God. But he is also man. Um, he, he was often fatigued and tired. We see how he slept in the boat as they crossed the Sea of Galilee. He was thirsty. Remember when he was on the cross and he cried out, I'm thirsty. Uh, he wept over the city. He, there, were, there were just so many things within him that, that tell us that he was completely 100% a man in a physical body, but he was also God. Colossians 2.9 says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he is a man, he is, a, he is God, and he is 100% both. The, the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit clearly tells us, and we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 4, that in the latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars. So be discerning. There are spirits who are giving false information and leading many astray. Verse 3, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Have to understand that Jesus is divine. He is God and he is fully man. Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So the believer's job, test the spirits. Test them carefully. We must be, as Jesus said, be wise as serpents, be as innocent as doves. And we're not to automatically embrace what is said by some teacher, whether they're well-known or not, uh, we have to be careful. and We have to see what they say about Jesus. He says in verse 4, he tells us, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Overcome those 
those false teachers, those and, and the spirits who are behind the things that they're teaching. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So when it comes to these false teachers, he, sa he tells us, you have the Spirit of God, and He is here to help you discern what the truth is. Jesus is alive, and He is living within you, and He wants to talk with you, and He wants to give you guidance. Remember what Jesus told us? Uh, told his disciples, I'm going away, but I will send you another comforter. I will send you the helper, and he will guide you into righteousness and into all truth. And we have the Spirit. The one who is in us is greater than the spiritual entities who are behind these false teachers in this world. Verse 5, they, the false teachers, are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. They have a false Christology. They, they look at Jesus incorrectly, and he says their message is worldly. Uh, it's another test of whether they're a false teacher or not. If, if not only do they look at Jesus incorrectly, but their, their, their teaching is very worldly. You know, there's a lot of teaching within the church that just is worldly teaching. And he says, that's not, that's not of God. That's false teaching. That's from evil spirits. Verse 6, we are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. So here's a third way to identify a false teacher. Uh, there are those who listen to the teaching of the apostles, and there are those who don't. He says, those who don't are false teachers. Because John says, the message that we have is the true message from God. They don't listen to us. They don't listen to the word of God. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Whether they're following after God's word. So verse, uh, verse 7. He tells them, dear friends. Let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, here's another way, truly, to know. If you have the Spirit of Christ living within you, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And if you have the Spirit of Christ within you, then you're going to recognize these false teachers. Because they do not have the Spirit of Christ. And they're not going to have the same agape love that uh, is, is evident of the fruit that we have from the Spirit. So he says, dear friends, let us love, let us agape one another. For love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So this unconditional love. I'm going to love you even if you hate me. Uh, it's, it's a different kind of love than we could ever know apart from Christ living within us. This is a love that expects nothing in return. This is a love that's not based on feelings. Agape is faithfulness, commitment. It's an act of the will. And you cannot love this way unless you're born again, he says. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. These evil teachers were not born of God. So you're going to see this evidence. They're not going to live in this way. You're going to mark them out because it's only going to be about this world and it's only going to be about themselves. Verse 8, whoever does not Love, agape, does not know God because God is love. If you really know God, you're going to love in this way because he lives within you. It's not how much of the word you know or how much you memorize. And this has always been uh, so much of a reminder for me because I've always loved the word. Uh, from, an, from an early time, in, in coming to know the Lord, I, I was looking for truth. What is the truth? And I, I settled so strongly on the word of God. 
And that's important. We need to know the Word of God. We grow by knowing the Word of God. But truly, it's, the growth is all manifested in love for God and love for your neighbor. If you really love in this way, then, uh, then he says, this is knowing God. This is truly being a spiritual man or a woman. Knowing God is, is loving the way that God loves. You know, there are great men who have stood in pulpits who have preached to thousands upon thousands, millions of people who uh, have not been great lovers of mankind. Truly, the foundation of being a true spiritual man of God is not how, uh, how many people you speak to, but it's how you love the person that's there that the Lord's put in front of you. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So, greatest example of agape, of love, is Calvary. Um, that's verse 9, verse 10. This is love, not that God that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Jesus came to be that sacrifice, to take our sins upon himself so that the wrath of God would no longer be upon us, that the penalty would be paid, and Jesus paid that penalty. He is the atoning sacrifice. Uh, the King James says the propitiation for our sins. We don't use that word very much, but it means that God's wrath is gone. It went upon Jesus. Now we can be forgiven. We were dead in our sin. God sought us. He sought us out. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 tells us. And this is how we know what this agape love is. He gives us an example. God sent his son. He says, you're a visual learner. You want to see what this love is? Look at Calvary. So God modeled it. He modeled it for us. Verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Since Jesus went to the cross, God's unconditional love, we ought to love one another. And Jesus said, it's this easy. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, that, that's the fulfillment of all the law. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. Uh, if we love one another, he says, God lives in us. And he wants to love those who are around. That's why he came. And now since he lives in us, if you will begin to allow him to do that, then uh, his love's made complete. That's, that's what he wants to do. Verse 13, this is how we know that we live in him and he is in us. He has given us his spirit. Praise God. You know, this is how we know. I mean, we know that we belong to him because his spirit lives within us. And it, the spirit of God does not live in these false teachers, but we know that he lives in us. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that we have the Spirit of God as a guarantee that we belong to Him. Uh, Romans chapter 8 tells us that uh, if you do not have the Spirit of God, you do not belong to Him. You must have the Spirit of God. Evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. You have been given the Holy Spirit. Now that evidence, he says, verse 14, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. We, are, we testify that Jesus is the Savior. That's how we know that the Spirit lives within us. That's truly the teaching. That's correct teaching. That's sound doctrine. That's sound theology. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Uh, verse 15, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. So we acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, and that's another way of saying that He is in fact, uh, divine. He is God himself. He is the Son of God, making himself equal with God. Jesus said that himself. Or his, 
His detractors said that of Jesus. He makes himself equal with God by saying he's the son of God. Verse 16, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Um, how do we know that we have the Spirit of God? How do we know that the Spirit is working in our lives? Well, we, we know and rely on God's love. I mean, that's, that's what a child of God does. And that's how we know that the Spirit lives within us. We're relying upon His love. God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. So, this is how we know we live in Him, and He lives in us. Um, how? I'll give you another reason. Verse 17, he says, This is how love is made complete among us, so that we uh, will have confidence on the day of judgment. That's another way that we know that Christ lives within us, that we belong to Him. There's no fear when it comes to judgment. Because we know Jesus has taken that judgment. There is no, we, we're going we're to have confidence. The day that we stand before him, we have confidence because we stand in Christ. And he also says, uh, in this world we're like Jesus. Uh, when you look at a false teacher, someone who is listening to demonic spirits, and someone who is, is teaching sound doctrine, he says, you look at the one who is like Jesus in the world. He says, that's the one you know belongs to him. That's the one in whom his, the Spirit of God resides. In this world, we are like Jesus, he says. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in Love, in God's love, in this agape. Once we truly understand the love of God, then fear is put aside because we know that uh, he, is, he is always for our best. He's always working for our best. Uh, there, are, there are many things that could bring fear into our lives. But as soon as we understand, wait, all things work together for the good, for, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. I know that God loves me, and I love God, and, he's, and I'm his child, and he's going he's to work everything out for the best. It may not look like it immediately, but I know that he's going to work everything out for the best. And once I understand that, then there's no love. There's no fear in, in, that, in that love anymore. I don't have to be afraid. Verse 19 he says, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So again, agape. It's a, it's a feeling. No, not a feeling, it's a choice. If you have bitterness, if you have anger toward anyone, then you choose to forgive and you do that right away. Forgiveness is all about a decision. And uh, this is something that I think he's still comparing the false teachers with those who are true to the Lord. Um, those who, to, who love their brother and sister with this agape love, they're from God. The others are not. Verse 21, And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and their sister. We love because he first loved us. And this proves that he lives in us. And this is something that the false teachers could not say. Amen. Amen. Remember, you're living in a world with many demonic spirits who are attempting to lead away those who are unsuspecting. Be on guard against false teaching. Amen.